Good afternoon, I am Andrea Chisholm with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. The Ministry of Education is reporting that over 1,000 of the students who sat the primary exit profile PEP exams were highly proficient. Over 42,000 students were registered to sit the exam. The results will be made available to schools registered for online platforms. Those schools who have not registered to access the results online can collect their results by 2 o'clock today at regional offices of the Education Ministry. And we'll join our reporter Prince Moore who is on location at the press conference a little later in the newscast for more details from that press conference. Meanwhile, the opposition spokesman on education is calling on parents to embrace the PEP exams and the results. At the same time, Ronald Thwaites wants the Education Ministry to use resources to help students with low scores. He maintains, however, that the exam was rushed, adding that the results may show that. I expect that there will, be, uh, there will have been some difficulties because of the newness of the curriculum and the strangeness of the examination. Whatever it is, we have to ensure that we help our children to remediate and to ensure that they are in the best position to benefit from high school education. He also renewed calls for grades to be published. The Education Ministry said it would move from a percentage format to the scale format and publish a profile on students' performance. I encourage parents and students to accept the placement which their child has been given and to join in the call for increased resources to be available for those schools where children with low scores and poor profiles are admitted. In other news, preparations are in high gear for the state funeral of former Prime Minister Edward Philip George Siaga. TVJ's Ashane Masters reports. It was a somber moment as a final rehearsal for the burial of former Prime Minister Edward Siaga took place in the wee hours of Friday morning. Members of the military, decked out in their respective regalia, sorting out the final details for Sunday. From the church to outside, Everything was done as if it was the real thing, from a shortened mock ceremony, the one on Sunday should last two hours, to the slow march from the Cathedral of the Most Holy Trinity on North Street to the burial site at the National Heroes Park. Friday, that march took a little over half hour, the military and police lining the streets just as they will on Sunday, saluting a mock coffin on a gun carriage to the burial ground. The mock coffin was even lowered as it will be during the ceremony this weekend, and wreaths were laid. Culture Minister Olivia Babsy Grange, on hand to observe, was excited about the preparations. We have had three rehearsals. Uh, today is the final rehearsal. Everything is in place, and we expect that Sunday we will have a very touching and moving state funeral for the most honorable Edward Siaga. Mr. Siaga died on May 28 on his 89th birthday. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. And plans for Mr. Siaga's monument are also underway. But five years after the death of former Governor General Sir Howard Cook, there is no monument. It appears work was rushed on his headstone. TV Day, TVJ's Dashan Hendricks reports. Preparation in high gear for the state funeral of former Prime Minister Edward Siaga on Sunday. The vault already dug and prepared facilitated the JDF on Friday in its full dress rehearsal for Sunday to lower a mock casket in preparation for the real thing on the weekend. Beyond that, further work on a monument is already in gear. Well, the Kingston and St. Andrew Municipal Corporation, they were given a responsibility to build the vault. 
the Jamaican National Heritage Trust will commission the monument and the UDC will build, design and build the monument. Any timelines on this? I can't say an exact timeline, but the intention is to move speedily in getting this done. In fact, the culture minister says the Urban Development Corporation, UDC, is already designing the monument for Mr. Siaga, but it appears a similar urgency has not been given to a monument for the grave site of former Governor General Sir Howard Cook and his wife, who passed away in 2014 and 2017, respectively. In fact, up to Saturday, June 15, our cameras captured an unfinished structure where the two are buried. Six days later, on Friday, June 21, a headstone. We asked the culture minister about the delay in getting a monument for Sir Howard. I'm not aware of what the reasons could be at this time, but it has been brought to my attention and I will ensure that that is also done um, soonest. I will certainly take that in hand and make sure it's addressed. But no monument is one thing. Rushing the headstone in the last few days and misspelling the word June, another, as shown in the lower left-hand side. It was something we observed Friday and asked Miss Grange about. I can't accept responsibility for that because that happened under a different administration. But that attempt to pass the blame was quickly withdrawn after we showed the headstone was done recently. Lady Cook passed away in June 2017 during the current wholeness administration. Ms. Greens, to her credit, set about right away getting the matter sorted out. She told us after that she asked the Jamaica National Heritage Trust to go through and check the graves for spelling errors and to determine where monuments should go, including for Mr. Siaga. Mr. Siaga's monument is strategically placed and what he what what his passing has done in is to symbolize the unity that you have all the prime ministers here and he is closing that circle currently in the park former jlp prime ministers sir donald sangster and hugh shera are buried on one side while michael manley is buried on another side with a road dividing the graves mr siaga will be interred on the same side as mr manley but with a space in between the grave sites presumably for another prime minister dashan hendrix tvj news Meanwhile, roads will close in the vicinity of the state funeral as early as 7 Sunday morning until 3 in the afternoon. The funeral will be held at the Holy Trinity Cathedral in Kingston starting at noon and interment will follow at the National Heroes Park. Only those accredited to attend the funeral will have access to the church and the park. And it's time for a break here on the Midday News. We'll have more story right after this. Welcome back and we're continuing the news. Now, earlier we told you that the Ministry of Education is reporting that over 1,000 of the students who sat the primary exit profile prep PEP exams were highly proficient and over 42,000 students were registered to sit the exam. As promised, we now join our reporter Prince Moore live for more details. Prince? Thanks, Andrea. Now, the minister this morning used the opportunity to explain the different categories used for all subjects, and the categories range from beginning to highly proficient. So students who range between 0 to 24% are at the beginning level. It moves on to developing with 25 to 40%. Students who range between 50 to 79% are proficient, and those ranging between 80 and 100% are highly proficient. Now, the results from the students' performance in the various subjects show that less than 10% of all students are at the beginning level. And at the other end of the spectrum, students, uh, a range of 6 to 13% of students are categorized as highly proficient in the various subjects. Now, a breakdown of the subjects show that 40% of the students who sat the test have demonstrated proficiency or advanced proficiency in mathematics, while 52% of the students are considered to be developing. As it relates to language arts, 55% of the students are uh, the demonstrated proficiency 
or advanced proficiency, while 36% of those students are considered to be developing. The other subject area was science, which showed that 49% of the students have demonstrated proficiency or advanced proficiency, while 44% are developing. Now, the best performance in the exam was social studies, with 60% of the students showing proficiency or advanced proficiency. Other achievements outlined this morning was that the ministry will be placing 100% of students in full secondary level institutions. 94% of students are well will be placed in schools of their choice. He also mentioned that 84% of the students on path have been placed in schools of their choice. The ministry is providing the individualized report for each student for the initial release along with a summary report for each school. And as you mentioned initially, all schools are now able to, all schools who are registered for the online perform, the online platform are now able to access results online and the other schools will be able to pick it up by two o'clock at their respective regional offices. There are some other achievements, Andrea, and we'll be providing the information in subsequent newscasts. Thank you very much. Our reporter Prince Moore there reporting from a press conference hosted this morning by the Ministry of Education. Now to a developing story. Two policemen are the subject of a probe by the Center for the Investigation of Sexual Offenses and Child Abuse, Sisoka, in connection with two incidents which occurred this week. The first involves a policeman attached to the Kingston Western Police Division, while the other involves a policeman attached to the Hanover Police Division. The cops are to be interviewed by detectives from Sissoka today. The allegations linked to the policeman in Hanover involve a minor. It reportedly occurred between Wednesday evening and yesterday morning in the holding area of the Lucy Police Station. The child later reported the incident to other police officers. The Independent Commission of Investigations, Indicom, is also investigating. Three people staged a protest this morning outside the United States Embassy in Kingston, outraged by the alleged mistreatment of five Jamaican fishermen by the U.S. Coast Guard in 2017. Shirley Richard. A couple of things. One, that they were chained. Really now? Those days finished with. They were chained. Secondly, that their boat, the vessel, was destroyed. Then they were just kept like on, on, um, on, the, on the dock of the ship. The food that they were served, the whole, the whole um, matter of the way they were treated while on board the Coast Guard. You know, all of that, very, very vexing, very, very troubling. Ms. Richard says they're disappointed with the government's response and are hoping that compensation for the men are on the agenda during discussions. I, we need full disclosure on the part of the U.S. government, if that is at all possible, knowing who the U.S. government is. But we need thorough investigations into what happened. I don't know, could it be the subject of a congressional hearing? I think it's important enough for it to take center stage in the U.S. media and for um, thorough investigations to be done in the U.S. and for the persons involved to be brought to justice and for the fishermen to be compensated. Residents of several communities in central Manchester are crying foul as thieves continue to steal livestock. One of the affected farmers said they stole a, stole a goat which was to support his family. Another farmer is calling on the authorities to do more as thieves are taking over the parish. Friday morning when I wake. All, All right, we're not going to take that clip, but those were some farmers in central Manchester complaining about thieves who are stealing their livestock. And in sports, the reggae boys will go in search of back-to-back -back wins at the CONCACAF Gold Cup when they take on El Salvador in Texas, United States later this evening. Another win would take the Jamaicans one step closer to the quarterfinals. TVJ's Simon Preston has our preview. 
The Reggae Boys began their 2019 Gold Cup campaign with a 3-2 win over Honduras at the National Stadium on Monday. The win marked the first time Jamaica defeated Honduras at the Gold Cup since 2011. Head coach Theodore Tapa Whitmore expects that victory to give the Jamaicans momentum leading into their next game. Well, yes, um, it should be a, a confidence boots uh, going in, into the El Salvador game. You know, um, I think from this game the momentum should take us through. You know, so we know it's going to be a tough game against um, El Salvador. They have won tonight as well, so we have to perform. The last time Jamaica played El Salvador was in March in the CONCACAF Nations League, where Jamaica lost 2-0, and team captain Andre Blake expects it to be a tough encounter. We know every game is going to be very important, you know, and, and we want to win all our games. That's the aim, you know, we know what El Salvador is about. It's not going to be easy, it's going to be another tough game. But we'll be up for the challenge, you know, we're going to have to go back now, uh, uh, do a recovery, make sure we're taking care of our bodies and learn from our mistakes tonight and just continue to move forward. Thank you, Simon. And that's the Midday News. I'm Andrea Chisholm. Join us at 7 for the Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.